Hello, and welcome back. This video is predominantly going to be about writing word equations. But before I get into writing word equations, I want to just remind you about how we balance things like hydrocarbons. Okay, so let's try to write and balance a chemical equation for several of these hydrocarbon examples. So let's start with this one. C5H12. That one is called pentane. And if you're going to burn any kind of hydrocarbon, it always requires oxygen. And the complete combustion of a hydrocarbon will produce CO2 and water. Now, I hope you remember the order we are to balance these. I said always go in the order C, then H, then O. So let's get started. On the reactant side, I have five carbons. And on the product side, I have only one. So I'm going to go ahead and add a coefficient of five in front of that. So now I took care of the C. Next I go to the H's. 12 H's on the reactant side, two on the product. I'll go ahead and add a coefficient six there. Now at this point, I've got only oxygen to go. I've got six oxygen from the water and another 10 from the carbon dioxide. So that's 16 oxygens. I need to add coefficient of eight for the O2. And that will take care of that one. All right, under 30 seconds, as we said, we should always be able to get these done in. Let's try the next one. Now, this one might be a little bit harder. C22H46. Well, that's a very long hydrocarbon. It would be a, a solid wax type material. And if you're going to burn it, think of a candle. It requires oxygen, and you're going to produce CO2 and water. Now, we're going to balance it in the same fashion. We're going to start with the carbon. I've got 22 carbons. I've got only one on the product side. So theoretically, I should put a 22 there. Now, why is it a 44? Well, let me go on. Let me, let's do it manually first. So let me get my pen out, and I'll show you where we're heading with this one. So maybe we would have written a 22 here to begin with. Okay. Now we've done the carbon. Next, we go to the hydrogen. 46 hydrogen. And I've only got two here, so I need to double that and write a 23 right there. Now, looking at this, I've got 23 oxygens over here, and I've got 44 oxygen right here. So I've got 67 oxygens to account for. Now, unfortunately, I only have two on the other side, but I remember that little trick. If I multiply this by 67 over 2, that's going to take care of this for me. So let's try that one more time. Get back to the pen. 67 over 2. Now, we said what we need to do from here, because we can't leave it as a half, is take this whole thing and double everything. And if you do that, you end up with 2 C22 H46 plus 67O2 goes to 44CO2 plus 46 water. And it turns out you cannot reduce the number 2 and 67, 44 and 46. So that is the balanced chemical equation for that reaction. Could you imagine if you were trying to do that with the guess and check method? You would never finish that one. All right, so let's keep going. So now you can see why I put a 44, a 46, and a 67, and a 2 there. That would then balance. But that's not how you would get it directly. You would have to do more work to get to that. All right, let's try another one. C15H28, and we're going to go ahead and burn that hydrocarbon with oxygen, producing carbon dioxide and water. Same game, do it always in the order of C, H, so I'll write my H and O, let's try again. C, H, and O, in that order. So 15 carbons over here, so I will go ahead and put a 15 right there for the carbon dioxide, so 15 carbons. Next, we do the hydrogens, 28 hydrogen. That means I need a 14 in front right here to make 28 hydrogen. Now I have 14 oxygen 
plus another 30 is 44 oxygen. So right here, I'm going to put a 22. And that one's now balanced as well. I hope that helps. And you can see how balancing hydrocarbons is not really any more difficult than any other problems that we were looking at. All right. Now we're going to turn our attention to looking at word equations. There's a worksheet that will go along with this. Uh, and again, you should have that in your packet. I'll put a link for it for you as well. So let's write a balanced equation between chlorine and sodium bromide to produce bromine and sodium chloride. So what I'm really looking at here is what chemicals are involved. So I'm reacting chlorine and sodium bromide. Well, you're going to have to come up with formulas for these. Chlorine, you remember, is a diatomic Cl2. Sodium is always Na1+. Bromide, because it ends in IDE, is the halogen Br1-. So that's going to be NaBr. So now we have the formula for sodium bromide and chlorine. And it's going to produce bromine. Bromine is another diatomic, Br2, and sodium chloride. Na is 1 plus, chloride is 1 minus, so this is NaCl. So now we have each of the right, the, the proper formulas, we can react these. So we're going to write a word equation first. I'm combining chlorine plus sodium bromide to form bromine plus sodium chloride. And, and that is the word equation. It simply uses the names of all the compounds or elements in your reaction. Now, it's nice in that you don't know, have to know how to write the formula, but it's not useful in terms of stoichiometric ratios. So the next step would be to write the correct formulas. Well, we already danced around that a little bit. Chlorine is Cl2, sodium bromide NaBr, bromine is another diatomic Br2, and sodium chloride NaCl. And then the last step, of course, would be use coefficients to make everything balance properly. So I look here, I've got two chlorines on the reactant side, only one on the product. So I would need a coefficient two to get two chlorines. That then gives me two sodiums on the product side, and I have only one on the reactant side. So I need a coefficient two in front of the sodium bromide. That then leaves me with two bromides on the reactant side, and I have two on the product side. So using those coefficients, 1, 2, 1, 2, I have written a balanced chemical equation. So we went from a word equation to a balanced chemical equation, right? Don't try to do it all in your head. You know, write out the steps when you do this. It'll, it'll, you make probably many fewer mistakes if you do that. All right, let's try another one. Write the balanced equation for the reaction between aluminum sulfate and calcium chloride to form a white precipitate of calcium sulfate. So the first thing I'm going to do is write, what am I reacting? And I'm reacting aluminum sulfate and calcium chloride. And it's producing a white precipitate of calcium sulfate. Now, just based on the names alone, there's something funny there. Where did the aluminum go? Where did the chloride go? Well, we didn't mention it but it must be the other product because we see here calcium and sulfate have been used. That means the aluminum chloride has not been used and that's the other product, the aluminum and the chloride. And so we'll make that the other product. Now, based on the law of conservation of matter, you should know that you can't lose atoms. So you'd be expected to figure that part out. The interesting part of the reaction is it goes from two colorless solutions, the aluminum sulfate and the calcium chloride, to make a white solid of calcium sulfate. That's the interesting part, so that's why they mentioned it. Next, what we need to do is write the correct formula. So maybe you remember aluminum is always and only 3 plus. Sulfate is SO4, 2 minus. So that gives me Al2, SO4, 3. For the formula for aluminum sulfate. Calcium is always plus two. Chloride ends in ID is the element by itself. It's a halogen, one minus. So how about CaCl2? 
going on to the product, calcium is 2 plus sulfate, that's the polyatomic ion, SO4, 2 minus. They have the same charges, then get right together, CaSO4. And finally, aluminum chloride. Aluminum is a 3 plus. Chloride is a 1 minus. Putting these together, AlCl3. So we'll go ahead and put those all down there. Hopefully that makes sense where they all came from. And the last part of this game is to balance it with coefficients. Now, if you remember, we said always do polyatomics first, the most complicated looking stuff. Well, I have three sulfates on the reactant side and only one on the product. So I would go ahead and put a three coefficient in front of that. Now I'm just gonna chase my tail around. I have three calciums on the product side. So I need to put a three here on the reactant side to get three calcium. That gives me six chlorides, six Cl's. I only have three on the product side, so I need to multiply that by two to get six Cl's, leaving me with two aluminum that I started with. So using the coefficients, one, three, three, two, we get the balance coefficients or the balance equation from this word equation, okay? Now, generally, we will be interested in the balanced chemical equation. We might say the words from a word equation, but it won't really help us very much. We'll, we'll need to be able to write those balanced equations. All right, well, let's, let's talk about this. This might be a little bit of a stretch, but let's see if we can figure this out. How would you prepare potassium nitrate? Now, it indicates that we could do this using a double replacement reaction. So let's look. I know that I'm making potassium nitrate, KNO3, so that I think it should make sense that one of my chemicals on the reactant side would have to contain a potassium compound, and the other one would have to contain a nitrate compound. Now, the only thing I have to figure out is, what's it attached to, and what's the byproduct? So if we remember, for a double replacement reaction, we were looking for what were called the driving forces. The driving forces, and there were three of these, if we formed water, the reaction occurred, if we formed a solid, the reaction occurred, or if we formed a gas, the reaction occurred. Well, let's go with water just to see if this makes sense. If water is the product, and I'm going to write water kind of funny, H-O-H, then the K must have been reacting with an O-H, and the N-O-3 must have been reacting with an H. Now, the name of this first substance is potassium hydroxide. It chemically is a base. The name of that second material is nitric acid. From the name, we can see it's an acid. When you mix these together, it makes the salt, potassium nitrate, plus water. This is an example of both a double replacement reaction as well as a neutralization reaction. Neutralization, as you recall, was when we took an acid, combined it with a base, and they neutralize each other, making a salt plus water. Okay? That's one way that I could get this to work. There are many ways that I could have produced potassium nitrate. I'm just indicating one particular way. So, again, if we are making water our driving force, then it's simply going to be an OH and an H+. Plus. That would certainly work where the K and the H are going to do the wife swap, right? They switch places. When they switch places, look at what I got, HOH and KNL3, which are my products. That's what's happening here. Let's say that uh, we put in here calcium nitrate instead of nitric acid. And if we did that, and we combine it with potassium hydroxide, let's see what products we would get. Hopefully, you would recognize that the potassium 
and the calcium are going to switch places. This is a double replacement reaction. So the K ends up with the NO3, giving us potassium nitrate. And the CA ends up with the OH, giving us calcium hydroxide. Now, this one doesn't have water as a driving force. It is producing, producing calcium hydroxide, but it says both potassium nitrate and calcium chloride are soluble. That means they both will dissolve in water, meaning these are AQ, which means there's no driving force, so there's no reaction. So even though we thought we were doing something special there, like we were coming up with the answer, the reality is nothing would happen if you put calcium nitrate in potassium hydroxide. Everything would just float around and there would be no chemical reaction there. We're going to talk more about predicting chemical reactions. That's a, that's a major topic that we want to make sure we can understand. We'll probably spend at least a day, maybe two days on that topic. We could balance it, but again, we're just kind of wasting our time if we did because it doesn't work. Well, let's try this. Um, if you combine potassium hydroxide solution with nitric acid, it will give you soluble potassium nitrate, but also water, which is the driving force. Okay, so here's KOH plus nitric acid goes to KNO3 plus, and then we said water. Water is a driving force, and therefore the reaction will occur. It says here the water can be removed by distillation, and what you'd be left with is solid potassium nitrate. That's how you would pull this out of solution. All right. Let's see and learn how to predict these reactions. So predict if a reaction would occur if you combine aqueous solutions of iron 2 chloride with aqueous sodium carbonate. Now aqueous means dissolved in water. So maybe we could write a word equation first. So it says if the reaction occurs, we want to write a balance equation showing it out. Okay, And we'll include phase notation, do all that special stuff. So I'm going to start with my words, iron chloride plus sodium carbonate. And that's a compound and a compound. That's generally a good clue that we should be thinking about a double replacement reaction. So the iron and the sodium are going to want to switch places. It's a double replacement reaction, meaning that the iron will end up with the carbonate and the sodium will end up with the chloride. So iron 2, chloride and sodium carbonate, there they are. What's going to happen is those ions switch places. So the iron and the sodium switch locations. So let's make that happen. There they go. And now I have two new combinations, sodium chloride and iron carbonate. Now, at this point, we could write an equation and make a prediction, but now in order to determine if this is going to work, what we need to know is, do we have a driving force present? So the driving forces, again, let's write them out. The driving forces, and these only apply to double replacement reactions, are the following. You must produce water, a solid, or a gas. Clearly, NaCl and FeCO3 are not water, so we did not produce that. In order to see if we formed a solid, we will use the solubility table, which I will show you how to use here in a second. Okay? So, let's keep in mind and remember NaCl and FeCO3, iron carbonate. So, I'll go to the solubility table, and... We'll